Welcome to Small Arm Solutions. Today we're doing a video that I'm sure will ruffle some feathers. Uh, this is a video on the M9 versus the M17. Uh, this is a very interesting topic because there was a very big problem with the XM17 with the way that the program was conducted. And I did a video on that uh, quite some time ago. It was called the failure of the XM17 program. And we're going to talk a little bit about that again here. But we're going to talk a little bit about uh, right now is sort of the way the M9 came about. Now, we had had since World War I, 1911, uh, we had had the standard 1911-45s, a seven-shot semi-automatic, single action only. And it was also not what you would call a safe pistol to carry loaded. Now, for military, it was the exact same, whether it's whether commercial, it was the exact same thing. And these pistols were known that you could have them cocked and locked, and they were to drop from, say, four to five feet on the muzzle, the energy from the firing pin would be enough to, to set it off. Now, before anybody goes off and says, well, you put heavier springs in there, that's not what they had. That's not what the U.S. military had. The way these guns were set up for the U.S. military, these things were prone to go off when they were dropped. And, you know, we were the only country in the world that did 45 auto. Now, at the time when the XM9 program came out around 1985 or so, it started before, that's when it actually was adopted, so I probably would say around 83, 84, when everything began. Uh, they wanted to have a NATO-compliant pistol. We were the only country in, in the world, for the most part, that used 45 automatic. Everybody else used 9 millimeter. So what were some of the reasons to get away from the 45? Magazine capacity. So first off, you have 7 rounds versus 15. Major, major difference. Um, the ammunition, for instance, uh, was other, another issue it was being controllable. For your average soldier who's not a firearms expert, who's coming to fire a gun for the first time, was proven over and over again that they shot better with 9mm. So when they brought the 9mm into, 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 uh, into issue, you would have much more people who were, who were qualifying on the first time expert, and everybody would pretty much would qualify with it, or the 45, you had a lot more recoil. Now, even during the World War I, World War II, and Vietnam when it was issued, this was still a fairly difficult gun for many people to qualify with because of the recoil. So again, recoil, caliber, safety. Those were the major reasons that this was gone. Now, we're talking about GI and 1911s. We're not talking about anything that's modern. This pistol has been outdated since World War II. With the, with the uh, introduction of the Browning High Power and the Walther P38, they all made this pistol obsolete for military use. I know there's going to be a lot of guys out there who are going to disagree, but in reality, for, for military issue, this gun has been obsolete for a very, very long time. 1985, the XM9 program. There is a competition that was put in place for the M9 XM9 pistol. Many companies that were involved in this, and which would include Berta, Sig, Colt, Smith & Wesson, Steyr, Walther, uh, just to mention a few. Now, notice there were some American companies that were mentioned in there. You had Colt and you had Smith & Wesson. That's going to play a big part of this. So when the fog settled, there's only two guns that completed phase one. Now, phase one testing basically is your initial down select. Uh, in the case of the XM17, it was a, a 12,000 rounds they were fired. In this case, it was through uh, a vice. It wasn't even in human hands. So once you, you go through the initial, the initial down select, that's what determines who your finalists are to move on to phase two. So these were the only two pistols that were able to get through that. Now, after that took place, now we get into phase two testing. Now, what is phase two testing? Phase two testing is really where the metal meets the meat. This is where you see if the weapon actually does fit the criteria for durability, reliability, for working in the sand, mud, dust, cold, heat, everything, and destruction testing and seeing what, the, what they are. Now, the requirement was only 6,000 rounds, which for both of these pistols was nothing. So when the, when the dust settled, we had two winners, the SIG 226 and the Brennan 92. Now, once you get to this point, this is where price comes into play, competitive bidding. So we had two guns that were equal. They both they both uh, withstood the test. Excellent, you know, very much excellent. Both those two went through it. Now it was competitive bidding. So when you look at what the competitive bidding came down to, both of those pistols came down to the exact same price. What made Beretta win was the price of the magazines and spare parts. They came in slightly under for that, which is where you have the M9 being selected. It went through, both pistols met the criteria, competitive bidding, only one winner. And it ended up being the 92 series. When the, when the adoption took place, there was a to be in three phases because both of these pistols were made overseas. SIG was made in Germany, Breda made in Italy. Now, 
according to the U.S. doctrine, the pistols may, had to be made in the United States. Every small arm we have has to be made in the United States. So the first phase, the guns were made in Italy. Phase two was half made in Italy, half made in the United States, and phase three was a completely U.S. made pistol. Now, let's start talking a little bit about the tests that it went through. The contract was for 315,930 pistols. The durability was really astounding. Look at one round in 17,500 rounds per failure. So that meant every for every 17,500 rounds, you would have one failure. That is like seven times what the criteria was for 6,000 rounds. So it far, far exceeded. So let's talk a little about what the pistol was. And this is exactly why this was a replacement for the 1911. First off, you have a 15 round magazine. Second of all, you had a double action on the first shot. The gun could be carried safely in this condition. So your first shot would be a long drawn double action pull, then it would go to semi-automatic, which meant you could carry it safety on or safety off, flip your safety up. This is how generally it was carried. You would have a safe double action gun. Now this also had what's referred to as a firing pin safety. If you look here, you'll see how this block rises up and down. This is a physical block that it locks the firing pin in place. So even if this even if this was to fail and it was to slam forward, there is no way that this will actually discharge. You can throw it up against a wall. You can throw it, you know, run over it with a car. There's nothing that you're going to do to make this thing go off unless the trigger is pulled all the way to the rear. And if you notice where the trigger is, is I'm pulling all the way to the rear at that point, which it actually lifts, is right before you hit, you you get to your shelf to to fire. So safety. Also, with the decock here, you also have a split firing pin. So if you look at the firing pin, when you engage the safety, the firing pin splits in two. So the firing pin's in, in one, piece is engaged, one piece is forward, the other piece is sideways. So that, that eliminates the ability for that firing pin to go forward. You have an open ejection port. What the open ejection port does is it eliminates any kind of failures to eject. With M882 ball ammunition, this, this does not malfunction at all. Uh, I can tell you from a couple instances, uh, while I was in the military, uh, we qualified with the M9s. There was not one malfunction that entire two days that we were out there. And I don't know how many thousands of rounds were fired, how many people went through that course. Um, we had never seen anything, anything malfunction. You have a good chrome line military grade barrel, easy disassembly. Basically you have a lever, you push the lever, drop the safety down, Slide comes right off. Push in your recoil spring, lift out, and push in your locking block pin, and you lift your barrel out. So looking at the barrel, you see we have a locking block, which is reminiscent of that of the Walther P38. What this does is it changes your recoil. With the standard Browning type system, the barrel unlocks down, and it gives you more of a snap. The barrel stays, stays stationary, and when it comes back, it, the locking block drops down, so you get a push rather than a snap, which gave us a recoil that was really, really nice. If we're looking at the bottom, we can see the firing pin safety right here, uh, where the actual block is. And the frame. We have the arm right here. This arm right here is what disengages the firing pin safety when it's, uh, when, it's engaged, when it's engaged. You pull back, you can see how that lifts up, you pull the trigger, that disengages that. You have your ejector here. You also see you have a nice little angle here that's cut in the, uh, the ejector. What that does is it gives you a good consistent ejection pattern. This, this one here, when you rotate the safety, this is what, uh, this is what decocks the hammer. That pushes down and that releases the hammer. So a very, very simple, very robust system that gave the soldier the ability to carry a weapon safely loaded and uh, was very accurate. Now let's address the, the, the real pink elephant in the room, which is 9mm versus 45. There is a fallacy out there that says the 9mm is not as effective of a band stopper as the 45. That is simply not true. It all comes down to shot placement. Basically, military rounds are full metal jacket rounds. Their whole purpose is to poke holes so the target will bleed out. Now, a 9mm hole versus a 45 hole in a human being, you will not notice a difference. There will be a hole. If you were to have a medical examiner look at it, he's not going to tell the difference between a 0.355 diameter hole and a 0.455 because the flesh will actually contract back down. So that is, that is a fallacy that uh, one is a better man stopper than the other. It all comes down to shot placement. Now, the 9mm, the only 
little uh, issue that it may have is it penetrates deeper because it's a smaller, higher velocity bullet. You got 185 foot a second, 124 gram bullet versus a 230 gram bullet that's probably around 800, 900 feet, 900 feet a second. It's, it's subsonic. So you have a slower bullet going slower. That doesn't mean that it's like throwing somebody a, like a softball that puts somebody versus a golf ball. So this is this is really a fallacy, uh, whether people want to believe that or not. But if you would talk to any medical examiner or anybody who actually who investigates homicides, most of the homicides that I investigated in my 10 years were mostly 9 millimeter 380 full metal jacket. Killed an awful lot of folks. So there's nothing about this caliber that is less than uh, optimal, especially when you're talking about ball ammunition. Uh, another little bit of a tidbit on this. Uh, one of the first articles I ever did uh, while I was working at LaserMax, we were testing our new laser out. So we did a 20,500 20, round endurance test. Uh, that was conducted over two days by myself, and there was one other guy who was, who was helping me out. In 20,500 rounds, we had one malfunction. It was due to a underpowered cartridge. Uh, the, you know, the slide didn't go all the way back because the cartridge was bad. The second was a locking block failure. We had a locking block failure around 19,000 something or other, maybe 200 or 300 rounds. And I actually knew uh, probably around 12,000 rounds that that was going to happen. I saw the signs. I saw the pitting on the uh, on the locking block. But this was a destruction test, so we want to take it to the end. So, again, you're looking at uh, 6,000 rounds that uh, is required to do. This one went 20,500 rounds, and the ammunition that was being used in that was not necessarily the best ammunition. There was a lot of plus P plus that was put in that. So that could have, have maybe it would have lasted longer if I would have done that. The reliability is there. So it went on to serve uh, from 1985. It served in the Gulf War, Global War on Terror, and several other small skirmishes. And there were people who were starting to make some complaints about them. Um, and that had to do with primarily lack of maintenance. You had First off, you had a magazine issue. Uh, during the global war on terror, uh, Breda was always a sole source, or they decided they needed a second source for magazines. So they checked, it was a Checkmate, I believe, who was the company that they gave the TDP to and they made the magazines. However, those magazines did not conform to the TDP, especially in the area of finish. This is a very smooth steel finish where Stan's not going to ingrate, you know, it's not going to get embedded into it. Where the finish that was used on the Checkmates was porous. It held sand. So when sand would get in there, it would hold the cart get the, cart the cartridges that were in the magazine could not rotate. They couldn't move up and they would get stuck in the magazine. Again, it's not the gun. It was the U.S. military used bad magazines. The next issue that came up was the slide failures. Now, this is something that's also very, very misunderstood. So let's talk about that. Within the first year or two that the M9s came out, there was some SEAL units that were testing them and they were shooting them. Well, they had a slide that fractured in both areas right here, and the slide came back and it struck a couple seals in the face. This drove panic. It was basically saying that uh, the U.S. military put out a bolt and you had to replace the slides after every thousand rounds. The guns went back to Beretta. Beretta did the metallurgy on them and found out that these guns fully complied. So the next thing was that Beretta wanted to know about the ammunition. So they got samples of the M82 ball ammunition that came in. And when it was tested, that ammunition was, was proof. It was proof pressures. What basically is, there's a difference between a 9mm uh, NATO cartridge case, military cartridge case, and a 9mm commercial. 9mm NATO is a much thicker case, and the powder cup sits up higher. So what happens is, is when you put your propellant in there, with that sitting up higher, it spikes much faster. So with a 9mm NATO, you have to decrease the powder amount to match the cartridge case to get the and, and to get the proper velocity, 85 feet a second. What they did was they took the military cartridge case and put the commercial load in it. When they put the commercial load in it, it caused plus P. So these guys were firing proof ammunition right through right throughout the gate. This is the strain that this pistol went through that caused that to crack. Now, the SEALs basically dropped the M9. They went to the, uh, the SIG P226. However, the SIG P226, with the same ammunition, experienced uh, frames cracking. It experienced... Uh, sugar bars that would crack and the early ones were not the stainless steel slide like you see here they were the uh, rolled sheet uh, sheet metal that had a pinned in gas block the pins that held in the spring pins that held in the breech block into the slide would also would also break so that ammunition basically destroyed anything that it got into especially in, in larger numbers so to deal with that uh, you're going to see some better pictures uh, but we'll, we'll take a look at it here as well you will see some better pictures but you'll see how this you hit this rounded area right here this is the hammer pin 
what they did was they increased the diameter of the hammer pin and they put a cut in the slide. So if the slide was to break, this would come back and it would and it would hit right at the edge here. It would prevent this, the, uh, the slide from exiting off the rear of the, the frame. Now, the US government was, was the one who had to pay for that because this was not a problem that was induced by Beretta or the design, it was induced by their negligence on the ammunition. So the US government paid for this modification and they also paid to have the entire fleet uh, the weapons that already existed in inventory modified to this because they didn't know how much this ammunition was out there. So to prevent this from happening later, uh, they made that change. Now there was another issue. Well, Beretta's reputation was very much damaged in the reputation of the M9 pistol or the 92F pistol. It caused severe problems for Beretta in their commercial and law enforcement sales because everybody was, would say, you know, you eat Italian steel, uh, you know, the slide coming back and hitting you in the face, when the reality was it was due to ammunition. No other country in the world uh, ever had issues with slides breaking. It didn't exist. It was only the U.S. government. It was only with use of this kind of ammunition. So Beretta took the U.S. government to court and sued them for defamation. And Beretta won. So uh, that, was a, that was an unfortunate incident, but uh, it was very irresponsible of the military to make any judgments or make any decisions without finding out what the problem actually was. So again, the pistol would go on to, uh, to serve very well all over the world. The French military even adopted it. You know, this had been used by militaries all over the world. Um, when I was in Jamaica, we saw Jamaican Defense Force carrying these. If you look at all the U.S. military foreign aid and foreign military sales, they're using weapons that are in our inventory. So these are provided to foreign militaries all over the world, you know, either free from the U.S. government or they were bought from the U.S. government. So one of the other uh, changes that we're going to talk about is, is going to be with the next pistol, which was adopted by the U.S. Marine Corps. The U.S. Marine Corps wanted a more durable uh, frame. They wanted to make some changes to it. So they got what was considered the M9A1, and M9A1 is an actual military designation. The difference is all in the frame. If you notice that we have a accessory rail on here for mounting a flashlight, we have a beefed up trigger guard so that would not get damaged. And also, if you look at the front straps, you'll see the checkering on the M9A1, which is on my my right hand side here, you see much nicer checkering. You see the same on the back strap. So they had imp improvements in that. Now, another very important change that they had was to the locking block. The US M9 pistol was a TDP pistol. It had to be, and everything had to comply with the, with that drawing. So whatever benefits or whatever enhancements that Brett had made over the years to the, to the pistol could not go into US military guns. This was not a TDP gun. This was a commercial off the shelf gun. So it did not have to comply with a TDP. So the most important change that was made was to the locking block. The original service life was eight to 10,000 rounds on the original locking block. And again, 6,000 rounds was the, was the threshold that the gun had to meet. Well, Beretta was not satisfied with that and they did some redesign work on the locking block. As you'll see from the photographs, you'll see the newer one has some stress relief cuts uh, up towards where the lugs are. That increased the life from to eight from eight to 10,000 rounds to up to 17 to 20,000 rounds. So that was a massive, massive improvement that should have been gone on to, gone to the M9. But again, the US government is, is so difficult when it comes to uh, making changes that the regular M9 pistol got the inferior uh, one, the Marine Corps got the good one. The slide, exact same as the M9. All the components in the inside are exactly the same as the M9. The only difference was the outside of this was, was the frame itself. Same internals, same slide. So all the so the entire gun was uh, serviceable by parts that were in the U.S. government inventory. Now we look to where we're at today. Not so long ago, there was a requirement uh, to replace the M9. It was a modular handgun requirement. Uh, there was also many, many companies that submitted to this. Uh, part of those requirements were a, you know, a grip that was was adjustable. Um, the final two pistols that one, that were in phase that got through phase one was the Sig P320 and the Glock 19X, if you want to call it that. It was basically a modular, they were modular handgun weapon system. It wasn't an actual number, but basically what it was was a Glock seven, a 19 slide with a 17 frame, and to meet the modularity requirements. Glock had the uh, removable back straps where you could adjust for your hand size. Where Sig, they went with a you know, you know, a different frame. You'd, you'd be able to swap out small, medium, and large frames. Now, another fallacy that goes to this too was the fact that the Glock they say was not modular. This was modular because you had a removable uh, trigger module. 
That had absolutely nothing to do with the decision to make to buy this pistol. There was no requirement set forth to have that modification. So all of you, back, all of you guys who seem to think that you know the Glock didn't meet the criteria, yes, it did. The final two pistols that met the criteria was the Glock and the the Sig. So now comes through to phase one. Phase one was twelve thousand rounds fired out of a rest. So basically, what happened was. The, these two pistols made it through. It was supposed to now go through phase two testing. Again, phase two testing is where you pin the guns up against each other. First off, to see if they both meet the criteria. In that case, you have one winner clear, two winners, where you have a competitive bidding, or both of them fail. So you had three different outcomes that could have come out of that. Well, due to the price uh, that uh, SIG offered, the U.S. military decided to skip phase two testing and adopted the SIG because it was significantly cheaper. Well, this was a significant failure because they have no idea if this is as good as this. This has a reputation, again, 38,000 rounds. And if you look at the, the durability, reliability, it's had consistently throughout the years. We know what this pistol will do. Have absolutely no clue what this pistol is going to do because they never tested it. So you have no idea how it would do in muds, mud, water, sand, but uh, hot, cold. They had no idea how it was going to work in any of those conditions. They didn't test it. They also had no idea how accurate it was. They also had no idea of how reliable it was going to be because they didn't test for uh, destruction. The U.S. military knew absolutely nothing and they adopted a pistol. That's where I say we had a failure of this program. You never skip phase two testing. Every program the U.S. government has, you have phase two testing. That's where you actually are competing the guns against each other to actually find about, the again, the interchangeability, the environmental testing, durability, reliability. And you also have troop trials, too. You put them in the actual hands of the troop uh, to see what the troops like. That didn't see, This didn't see that either. It did not go through anything what this one went through. So this was supposed to be an improvement over this. Do we even know that it was an improvement? All that we know is this is striker fired, this is hammer fired. That's about all that we know. This has a nitrated barrel. This has a chrome line barrel. Um, both of them have a firing pin safety. So, what are the consequences? So we have two guns now. Uh, Glock introduced a one-gun solution that met both criteria. The SIG introduced a two-gun criteria. You have the compact M18 and the full-size M17. So now we have two guns in the inventory instead of one, which... To be all fairness, the Beretta was full size and they adopted the SIG P228 as the M11, I believe it was. That was a compact one for CID and for MPs and so on and so forth. So we had we have two guns now. Well, right after the guns came out, they experienced major failures. Uh, they had failures to uh, feed ball ammunition. I'll tell you what, I've never seen a military gun that didn't feed ball ammunition. If it came out of hollow points, you could definitely see that on occasion, but you never saw that. There were other mechanical failures with it. And also, which I also have a hard time believing, I'm sure all of you guys know about the P320 failures when they were dropped and they went off. But SIG said categorically that they had nothing to do with the U.S. government guns. Well, I have a hard time believing that due to the fact that uh, so many of these guns were returned to uh, SIG. They went up on the commercial market. Now, in the history of the M9, the M1911, there was never an overrun of these that went out to the commercial market. They took every gun that they could have. So why did SIG return those guns? It wasn't because of the color of the, of the, of the, of the safety. The finalized ones used black. The original ones used uh, the tan. Now, SIG would have you believe that the case was that uh, they just wanted to change out the colors of these. They had nothing to do with the durability and reliability and safety. Well, I beg to differ. I believe that the U.S. government saw the exact same failures uh, with the P320 as everybody else did and told SIG, fix it. And the way SIG fixed it was they brought the guns back to, to SIG. They replaced the guns with new guns that had the new trigger mechanism that all the P320s have now. And then all these other ones were retrofitted with the new triggers so they were safe. And they were sold on the commercial market and sold for an incredible amount of change. So if this would have gone through phase two, the drop safety, the, the malfunctioning, the durability, the reliability, parts breakage would have all come to fruition prior to a gun being adopted. Now, that's not necessarily a showstopper. When you look at those those that criteria, you will see, okay, are these are these 
malfunctions, are they showstoppers or are they ones that are uh, something just through the normal course of uh, development and, and, uh, and getting it ready for the troops, they would change and modify. So it could go, it could go either way. So the U.S. government spent money and SIG lost uh, quite a bit of money on the repair work because the prices that they were giving these, what they're practically giving them away, probably at cost. Uh, there was no way that the Glock could have met that price. Uh, with with the, with that with the gun, they were they were not willing, not willing to give their guns away for free. Um, Sig just want they wanted that military contract. They were willing to basically take the loss on the government guns and figure they would make it up on the commercial guns. So I think we're gonna do go to the range and we're gonna fire a couple of these. Go. Okay.
Of course, the versions that I, I had shot were the were the commercial versions. Uh, the this here is is the actual M17. This was the the commemorative. Uh, this one has never been fired. The one that I had was the P320 M17, which was the commercial model, and this is the P320 M18. So we had shot I mean, shot them both significantly. Uh, Again, these are updated versions uh, where we didn't have the problems with them. These were long after the, the problem with the, the uh, drop safety issue. Um, for as far as accuracy is concerned, I think they're both comparable. For as far as recoil, I think the Brian is better because of the oscillating uh, locking block. For as far as confidence, I have to say at this point, I don't have a lot of confidence in the M17 and the M18. And the reason being is the U.S. government has not come out and said, we put this thing through the criteria, it's passed and uh, it's good to go, and the numbers show that it's either equal to or superior to the, M the M9. So now, I swear, we'll get into my opinion. My choice would be the M9. Uh, I've shot the M9 since I was 17 years old. I was one of the youngest people in New York State, Monroe County, to get their pistol permit at 17 years old. Now it's 21. But I had had that from, from then, and I had carried that for many, many, many years. I never had a malfunction. I always had complete other faith in it. I knew what it did, and personally at Laser Max, I did a 20,000 five round endurance test. And also, we had one or two pistols that we would shoot five rounds through every laser. So God knows how many thousands and thousands of rounds uh, went through those pistols without malfunctions. I occasionally, probably every 10,000 rounds or so, I would uh, take a slide apart and I would clean them. The things always worked. Now, this one. With the way that it was adopted, that's a red flag. Once it was adopted, all the problems that it had, that's another red flag. So for as far as my trusting is concerned, um, I don't have it until I get better information on what the government has done with it. Uh, I'm tending to stay away from it. Now, was this actually an enhancement over this? I, you know, uh, striker fire tends to be a little less reliable because it's a, it's a lighter striking firing pin than a, uh, than a double action, which is much harder. Now. The benefit of the striker is you have one trigger pull that's the same for your first shot to your last shot. The Beretta, you have a long drawn heavy double action pull, which sometimes can, can make you uh, shoot low. And then once you get to switch over to your single action, you tend to shoot high because you have two different trigger pulls. Reliability. This one definitely has it. This one's proven. This one, for as far as I'm concerned, is not. Um, for as far as... Uh, Recoil springs. This one had to come with two recoil springs because you had one recoil spring that was for U.S. government ammunition and one for commercial ammunition. So this gun had to be specially tuned for government ammunition, uh, where this one here, didn't matter what it was, this one here didn't have to be modified to shoot any kind of hollow points either. Pretty much anything you put in the Beretta, it would, it would eat without a problem. So... That's pretty much my opinion uh, on the M9 pistol versus the M17. I believe there's a lot more uh, testing that has to be done. I believe the program was a complete failure. The U.S. government did not do uh, just by the American soldier. Their job is to make sure the American soldier gets the finest weapon that they can get. And it's not nothing to do with low bidding. Again, when, it, when you had these two, these two both passed the criteria. They both passed, and that's what required the competitive bidding. You didn't get one that was, was any less than the other. Uh, so... A lot of people say that it was oh it was the lowest bidder it was the lowest bidder not on the gun but on the spare parts of the magazines somebody had to be a winner so I think uh, time will tell uh, how well the M18 is going to hold up um, I'm certainly waiting to see it um, again this is the main pistol you see here this has the the laser max defense uh, laser module you had an IR laser you also had a uh, flashlight. There's very few of these that were made. We've had a lot of uh, people discussing this on the forums and say why they can't get a hold of them. So I'm going to answer that for you right now. The reason why you don't have those is because this was made by Laser Max Defense, not Laser Max Incorporated. Laser Max Incorporated was responsible for commercial sales only. When Laser Max Defense went off into its own entity, they had an agreement with Crossman Air Guns who bought uh, Laser Max, you know, you know, Laser Max company, that they would not sell on the commercial market. They would leave all the commercial market up to Laser Max Corporation and all defense would go to Laser Max Defense. This product came out of Laser Max Defense, so they were not allowed to sell it. So the people who were able to get these, they're basically they're probably stolen from the US government. Uh, that's why you never saw them, because they were two separate companies. And unfortunately, right after the first shipment of these were made, Laser Max tried to get the second one and the army wasn't ready for it. Laser Max is very much hurting for money, and unfortunately, it caused Laser Max Defense to shut down. 
Uh, they didn't get any other government contracts. They were trying to get another one for this. The Army wasn't ready to get more of these. And Leisurebacks Defense is now gone. So this is out of production. So these are very coveted by a lot of collectors because they were never available to the commercial market. And when they do, when you do find them, they're very, very expensive. So that's why this module is not available. So I hope you guys enjoyed my assessment of the M9 versus the uh, M17. My, my assessment is based off of knowing the criteria, knowing how U.S. government testing is done, and seeing how it was completely failed in here. And without knowing which was better, the Glock or the uh, SIG. Now, for, I'm not brand loyal. I'm what works loyal. Now, if phase two testing could have come along, Maybe Glock would have won. Maybe Sig would have won. Maybe they both would have won. There would have been competitive bidding. It would have been proper. We would have made sure that the U.S. soldier got the proper weapon, one that met the criteria, whether it was through a sole winner or whether it was through both winning and then doing competitive bidding. We would have known they got the right thing. We don't know, again, did they get the uh, right Did they uh, get the right weapon? Was the Sig P320, did it meet the criteria? You know, Glock never got the chance to compete. Glock tried going after the government for this too, because you know they spent they spent their money to get the gun ready, to do all the drawings, to make the modifications, to make the, all the manuals, to do everything that you have to do to submit to a government tender, and they never even got to compete. Again, I'm not brand loyal. These two guns who got through phase one should have gotten through phase two to actually find out what the real story was. That's the problem. And again, after this was all over with, the guns went into circulation all those serious malfunctions, this would have been caught in the beginning. So uh, this is sort of, sort of a rant. It's uh, something I have a, a very big opinion of because I've been part of many government trials uh, with governments all over the world. And the way things are tested are the same way they do here, phase one and phase two, initial down select, final select. And we, they, we failed that. The U.S. government failed that. So I do hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you do, please click like, please subscribe, and even better share.